How's everyone doing today? This is Steve Wantrop with Collider, and I am here with writer-director Stephen Knight for Serenity. How are you today, sir? I'm very good, thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming in studio. Um, as I was saying off camera, I think it's been about three or four years since we last spoke. Yeah. Um, so how have you been doing? I've been very busy. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of stuff. Um, and, and I think we'd spoke about Taboo before. Uh, yeah. But there's been lots of things going on since then. Yeah, um, you, I want to jump backwards. Mm -hmm. uh, you got into the industry a long time ago, mm -hmm. but it feels like the last, for me, just looking at your career, it feels like the last 10 years have been on fast forward. Just you working a lot and on a lot of cool projects. Have, does it feel like that to you? Yeah, I mean, it's a mixture of things. There's been a lot of stuff that I've written recently, but also a couple of times, um, it's a bit like fishing, where you write a script and you cast it out and you leave it there. And then 10 years later, somebody comes along and makes it. So uh, it's the same with the, the year coming up. There's a couple of scripts I've written quite a while ago that have been picked up and, and are getting made. And, you know, television has happened. And I love it. And so I'm doing quite a lot of TV as well. Uh, I have a, a bunch of things to jump into, yeah. but uh, I want to start with what would you love to guest write and direct that you've seen on television? Um, uh, the, the issue with that is I don't really watch a lot of other. TV, um, I sort of pretend it's deliberate so that I, it doesn't affect what I do, but um, to be honest, a lot of the stuff I've, I'm watching on TV is Peppa Pig, it's um, Paw Patrol, it's just a lot of kids' stuff, right? Uh, because the television is sort of run by the kids. That uh, makes some sense. I mind you, I could guest write and direct Paw Patrol, perhaps, <laughs> which might be good fun. Um, I can only imagine your version of that show. It would be <laughs> quite, quite interesting. Dark. You know? Um, uh, so let me, I have a million other things, but I want to jump into why I get to talk to you today. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about how this, where did this script come from in terms of, was this something that you'd been developing for a while? Or was this like the idea came out of left field and you're like, I want to make this? Yeah, it, it, I don't know where ideas come from. Um, it, and it's very difficult to sort of go back. I suppose the gestation of this was, a long time ago, maybe seven years ago, I was. I like to go fishing, and I was in St Lucia, and I went on a tuna boat fishing. And the person who ran the boat um, was really nice and good to you, and 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 gave you beer, and and you know, was, you're a tourist and you're paying him, so he was really great, until a fish bit, and then you didn't exist. He was obsessed, obsessed with catching fish. And I just really like this sort of, this person living in paradise with a beautiful life who just couldn't relax, he couldn't stop, he was driven to catch a fish. So I wanted to sort of recreate someone like that in a, in a situation like that, but also I was interested in the possibility of writing a perfectly serviceable movie with a script, uh, with a plot, and with characters that work, and then in a way that I really, my ambition was to make it so that no one's expecting it. You pull the rug and you change it. Um, so that was, those two things came together and I thought it would be great to do what feels like a very simple, straightforward triangle, if you like, in terms of characters and then make it something totally other than that. I, um, I say congrats to that because as I was watching I, I knew something was gonna, you know, you're building, there's something going on here, mm. but I could not figure it out until um, you started giving more clues yeah. in the third act, which is, you know, as someone who's seen like uh, thousands of movies, it's, it's rare. Good, good. Well, that's, that was the plan, that was the ambition. Uh, I definitely have to talk about the casting process. Uh, this is the first time Anne and Matthew have worked together, I think, since Interstellar. Yeah. So w talk a little bit about who came on the project first, and was it one of these things where one of them is texting the other, being like, hey? I, th I think that did happen. I mean, it's always mysterious to me how scripts reach people. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, CAA has its network and all of that, but th there are other mysterious ways where you will just get contacted by someone sometimes directly who happens to have read the script and that's what happened in this case and I think it was Matthew who responded first and it's always great when you get someone like Matthew McConaughey to um, engage and once we had him we pretty much got first choices for all the and Anne was first choice and you know uh, when those dominoes start to fall it's always very satisfying. Has it changed a little bit because you've been writing some, I mean, after Taboo, you've been writing so much stuff and, and, and been getting really good actors. So 
I guess my question is, when did the script get finished? Let's start with that. When mm -hmm. did you finish the script? I think it was probably about nine months before we started shooting. Maybe a bit more, no, maybe 12 months, because we spent some try time trying to find the location um, while I was finishing off the script. Um, we tried different places, we tried Dominican Republic, and I tried to make it work in Bermuda, but then finally we realized that um, we got lucky with Mauritius. So it was about probably just over a year before we started shooting. So the process on this was quite quick. Well, my question is, so you finished the script. At that time, is Matthew involved? Or is it one of these things where you're finishing the script and then you're going to push it out into the world? Yeah, I mean, I don't tend to let it out until it's done, until it's finished. So but once it was finished, it got out quite quickly. And, you know, responses came in quite quickly as well. When you, so you finished the script, mm -hmm. do you have financing in place at that moment or? Yeah, I mean, this was what, you know, sometimes making a film is really difficult. Sometimes it's impossible and sometimes it just happens somehow with doors opening. And this was one of those occasions where I'd done two films with um, I Am Global, which were um, Hummingbird and Locke. And... I just, it just seemed to be like we had a system going and I showed them the scripts and they said, yeah, we'll do it. And then we got Matthew and, and then, it, you know, all of, the, all of the procedures seemed to happen quite effortlessly after that. Sure. You, it's funny you mentioned that uh, about the script and getting into Matthew's hands. I've spoken to some other filmmakers who, um, I think Drew Pierce with Hotel Artemis, he w doesn't understand how Jodie Foster got no, a copy it, of the script it, because true. he hadn't released it. Yeah. And somehow, and she called him and said, I want to you know, do this. Yeah. He's like, how do you even have this? Exactly. And, and it, I don't know what that system is. I mean, it's great. I'm glad it happens. But it does seem to be that there is not this sort of official, there is an official system where you, you know, you say, I'm, I'm offering this to an actor, especially an actor of a profile of someone like Matthew. You know, you wouldn't um, offer it to more than one actor if one of them was Matthew McConaughey. But in this case, it just seemed to find its way into his hands. Sure. So you, you finish the movie, you, you shoot, you finish the movie, you're in the editing room, which is ultimately the final rewrite. Yeah. What did you learn from friends and family screenings or any test screenings that impacted the finished film? It was... Um, the I think the th the major thing I learned was not to underestimate an audience. In other words, they're on to you very quickly if you give any sort of clues. I mean, it's as you were saying about tipping your hand. If if you give small clues, people are very literate in movies and they will start to 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 guess what this what the twist is. Um, and I think it's it's the same with any process like that. You have to take with a pinch of salt. The responses of people because in the end you know you do a test screening for members of the public and they'll fill in their cards and all that but I think in the end you have to make the film you want to make and you can you can chase your tail for so long you know trying to change stuff but I think the main thing I learned from those screenings was if you are too generous with the clues as to what's really going on people will find out so did you have more clues in the first act yeah i mean we had various versions i mean the, you know in a way i sort of wanted there to be no clues as well but you, people i think feel a bit cheated when that happens so you have to sort of set things up i always think that in filmmaking there is a tradition of setting up a surprise you know you prepare people for a surprise which in my mind makes it not a surprise so with this, I wanted to keep it as clean as possible, to keep it as that is what the film you're watching is just that until you spring the trap. Yeah, I, I was going to say that I, for me, planting a few seeds is yeah. important, yeah. but not, but not uh, germinating those seeds, if you will. Exactly. And I, I mean, I like the idea that people know there's something going on, because what I've tried to do is make the dialogue just a little bit large just a little bit noirish, just a bit not real, just so that people would guess that this wasn't quite the reality they were expecting. Um, when you're working on the script, though, you have to be like, okay, I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to get some actors, but having Jason Clark, Anne Hathaway, Matthew McConaughey, uh, and a number of other people that are... Uh, you know, strong supporting roles. Yeah. Um, you know, Diane Lane. Jeremy Strong is yeah, brilliant. Yeah, um, when when did you realize? Oh shit! I this really came together. Yeah. And, and again, it's it's one of those mysterious things about the way films happen, is that sometimes you can labour and work and you know 
go after people and try and put it together and the finance then falls apart and then when you get the finance the actor is is busy um, i mean all the familiar things that everybody knows but sometimes things just happen quickly and easily and that was this was one of those occasions and i think not because of any sort of ability on my part it's just sometimes you get lucky uh, did you have a much longer first cut with a lot of deleted scenes or was it? Yeah. I mean, as ever, you know, the, it, it, the edit is about what you get rid of. And, and um, we had quite a bit of stuff that didn't make it in. It's really important to have that f amount of stuff so that, you know, you can cut stuff out. Um, you know, I'd love one day to write a script. Well, I suppose Locke was like this, but one day write a script where everything you write ends up on the screen because that would be sort of quite satisfying process but it's never really works out like that did you have like 20 minutes of deleted scenes or is it just a little bit no it's probably about 15 so what what's like kind of some of the stuff that you cut out was it like repetitive dialogue or information i think i think the the only way to in my opinion with the edit it's rather than go into a scene and chip away at it um i think it's best to leave the scene alone let it breathe but then if you're going to cut cut a whole scene so you know there were whole characters that were taken out, not because of anything that to do with the character, but to do with pacing and to do with, you know, what that character is revealing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we took, my view is take a whole lump rather than take little bits all the time. What is it like, say, so you cut, you remove a character. What is it like calling that actor and saying, hey, you did great, but it, it's just not going to make the movie? I wouldn't know because I'm a coward. <laughs> Um, you know, I think that the, gr the great thing about actors, they know the business, they know it's tough and they, I think, it, you know, everyone knows that things are going to change in the edit. So, um, you know, that's life. That's the way it is. I think. Do you, when something like that happens and it's say an actor that's not very well known, but they had some key scenes with Matthew McConaughey, is it something where you're willing to maybe let them have some of that for their reel or it's once it's cut? Oh, I mean, they can have all of it for their, I mean, if, if someone wants something to, to help them with their career, I wouldn't stand in the way of that one bit, you know, but, you know, it's like be, with a writer, you write stuff and it gets rejected sometimes. So that's just, that's the business really. Uh, what was the scene, and I don't want to do spoilers, but was there a scene that you repeatedly went back to? Ooh, because yeah. every time I speak to directors, they talk about how there's always a scene or two mm. that you are struggling with the entire yeah. edit. And uh, what was that for you? Um, I suppose, uh, a couple of scenes near to the, I mean, the, the scene I'm most pleased with is the scene on the beach with Matthew and Jeremy. And that um, I went back to so many times because there's certain reveals in there that either you do reveal or you don't. It was very important to me to get that right because I'm, I'm trying to make something that's about the, an existentialist sort of um, treatment of, of, of what a film can be so that in the end, ultimately, the questions Matthew is asking and the discussion he has with Jeremy on the beach is about the nature of existence, which I don't care if it sounds portentous or pretentious. What's the point of doing things if you're not going to explore something like that? And so it is about, um, you know, the nature of, of reality. So I went back to that many times. Um, but it, it, I think there's also an issue with when you when you're putting a film together is that the scenes that you love the most are often for some reason attract the most attention in terms of cutting sometimes people always seem to go for the scene that you love most and try to cut it because in my opinion a scene that does no work a scene that doesn't move the plot along which is often considered to be superfluous the way i see it is it, it must be there for a reason other than plot so it's probably good I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, it, it's so, in, it's so interesting. I talked to so many directors and you mentioned how you might remove a whole scene and I'll talk to other directors who'll be like, no, we just picked away at it. You know, yeah, I mean, everybody's different and God, you know, everybody's right in their own way and wrong as well. And, um, I think it's a question of, uh, for me, you know, when I'm writing it, I hope I'm going through the editing process there and then on the page so that in terms of dialogue, I always feel that I've got that. I've got the dialogue right as that's how it should be. And so therefore moving that around is difficult. Whereas if you say, okay, this scene isn't earning its place, then you can just take it out. Uh, with a movie like this, where there's more going on than what you see, uh, 
How have you been describing it to friends, the film? Um, <laughs> it's difficult because it's, I hope it's a thriller. Uh, I don't really like the word noirish, but I hope it's a thriller that um, appeals to people who like thrillers and people who like fishing. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw um, someone called it a uh, sexy noir. Sexy, yeah. sexy fishing noir. Sure, yeah. let's, I'm going to rephrase it. Sexy fishing noir. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I want to jump onto a few other things real quick. Um, I had no idea that you were one of the creators of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yes, I'm very proud of it. Um, many years ago, uh, myself and two others, um, I was writing as well, but I was w working at um, a production company that also did game shows. So you could just walk up the stairs and say, I've got an idea. And one of them was, he wants to be a millionaire. And that was fantastic. It is in 160 countries. Yeah. Uh, that's just insane. Yeah, I, I, I've heard a, 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 a statistic that said it's the most watched TV program in history or something. It, it's it's crazy. <laughs> um, it's crazy. I don't want to, uh, uh, I was going to make a joke, but I mean, do. do, when, do. Um, so my question is, um, when it's cold in London and you mm. need to warm your house, are you burning $100 bills? <laughs> no, pound notes. No. Um, <laughs> the 100 pound uh, notes, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it was very kind to me and all the other people involved. It was great. But, you know, I, I write because I'm sort of compelled to do it. So I always, I don't think I will ever stop. Writing. Sure. But you are burning 100 pound notes to keep no. warm. No. Just kidding. No. <laughs> Eco friendly biomass. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I loved Eastern Promises, and uh, there was always talk for a while about uh, more in that story. It's coming. Is it? It's written. And now you we see. I think I've heard that. Yeah. But is it really coming? Well, funnily enough, as of right now, um, you know, as I say, it, it is like fishing where you leave it out there, and it's been out there for a while, and it went through. Um, um, permutations in the sense of, uh, you know, how do you follow Vigo? So we've been through that when we've moved on and now we're in a position where, um, I will say watch this space, but we're, we're close to getting into production. Really? Yeah. And is this going to be, so it's not with Vigo though? No. And it's a, uh, I mean, I, you never know. Um, and who, do you have a director? Yes. I can't really talk about this yet, but yes, we I don't do want to get a, you in trouble. We, no, we do have a director, and, and we are out to a couple of really good actors. I completely get it. So, you do you think this could actually be filming this year? Yes. So you have financing and things. It's just a question of locking yeah. down. Yeah, exactly. I got it. Um, yeah. That's awesome. Is it the same script that you wrote a while ago? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I was. It, it's changed a bit, um, and it changed quite recently as a result of events in the world. Um, because of the the um, topicality of the Russian thing. And so, yeah, I've adapted it to reflect recent events. I don't want to get you in any more trouble, but I cannot wait. Um, jumping into Taboo, uh, so I watched the first season. We talked a long time ago, and when I saw Tom Hardy last, I said, uh, so where's the second season? Uh, get off your ass. And Quite so right. Where is the second season? Uh, it's almost completed in terms of the script. Uh, we had a couple of delays because of other commitments, um, but we are hoping to start shooting end of this year or the start of next. Okay, so it's definitely coming. Yes. It's and uh, um, how does is there a time jump from the first season? Is it because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, it was designed as a three season show. It, it still will be. I mean, it, you know, if I if if we all stick with it and we all want to keep doing it, it would be three. That's that's my plan because I've got a geographical sort of route for the thing to take, uh, and it's basically a journey west, and so. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have a destination in mind, which is always nice to have if you're, you know, if, if you're setting off on this sort of big journey, which is what writing three, eight hours is, it's good to know where you're heading. Uh, and so it's another eight hours for season two. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm saying uh, awesome. You have a, a great relationship with Tom. You've worked yeah. together a number of times. What is it, does he have... Uh, compromising pictures of you or do you have compromising pictures of him? It's really strange because <clears throat> I think it works because we don't socialize, you know, we do occasionally but not very often and I think that the relationship is, is totally about the work and the great thing about Tom is 
that's his passion is the work the the acting you know he 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 he's not um a fan of celebrity but he just loves to act and he loves the the process and the craft and for me to have him occasionally available to do roles that you've written is is wonderful because you know you know you can trust someone to to really deliver what you're doing um and i mean uh, lock and and taboo were sort of came about because of each other where i was invited to meet tom to talk about writing this thing taboo and i was developing lock and tom was parking his car and i spoke to his manager and said look do you mind if i mention this project and he said no so we did a deal where he would do lock if i did to be that's so funny <laughs> uh you guys might also do a christmas carol yeah we we are definitely doing that i mean it, it, that is written um it's going to be three one hours and it's largely done finished in terms of the script we're planning to shoot this year and hopefully get it on the screen for christmas so is it so it's is this like a bbc thing like yeah. who's it's BBC plus um, an American element, which has not been announced yet. Uh, I understand. And so what role is Tom playing in this? I'm not going to reveal. Say no um, more? I don't want, again, don't want to get you in trouble. But he's going to be um, pivotal in the whole thing. Got it. Is it? That's not a clue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you thought about other casting and stuff? Yeah. I mean, we're out to a couple of people. I mean, it, what, I'm what I'm trying to do and what I'm planning to do is... Um, adapt five Dickens novels. I mean, Christmas Carol's not really a novel, but adapt Christmas Carol plus four novels and um, do it over a period of, let's say, six or seven years and have a repertory of actors. And I think we'll get the best actors, hopefully, in the world to, to take part because the Dickens characters are so great. And just do, like, Copperfield and Oliver Twist and Great Expectations. Um and do them in a in a modern way. I mean, not really in a taboo way, but it's sort of like that. And well, the thing about taboo is it's <clears throat> real gritty. It yeah. is like you're stepping back in time in terms of the dirt, yeah. the mud. Yeah, it's like you're there. So is that what you kind of the element you want to add to these yeah. stories? Yeah, I mean, the idea is that when Dickens was writing, I mean, he would have been a TV returning series writer, I think, because that's how he worked, and he. When he wrote his novels, he did it in instalments and released them in magazines so that people were, there were cliffhangers and people were waiting for the next episode. Um, and as far as he could, according to the sort of uh, fashions of the time, he did deal with the darker side of London and poverty and, you know, things that were really going on. He couldn't really go into the detail in the way that we can now. So what I'm trying to do is things that are past, possibly implied in Dickens, we can actually express i like this it will be great i think it's really good i mean i think if we if we can make each novel eight hours of of good television with really good actors it'll be and something that you can at the end of it you can say look i did this it's done i got it so it's basically each year so this year would be christmas carol yeah. what what do you have an order or uh, sort of not set in stone i quite fancy doing david copperfield next uh, it's so interesting. I love the idea of each one of these has different actors. Would yeah. You, would, but Tom would be in each one. I think so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> what am I? What, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, you also, uh, something I'm so excited for, because um, I'm a big fan of Francis Lawrence, is this new Apple show, oh, C. Yeah. Uh, I've spoken <clears throat> to a few people that are involved, and it sounds very high concept and big. Uh, yes. If I'm not mistaken, you wrote an episode? Or are you, how involved are you? I've written, <clears throat> I've written all of it. I mean, I created it. Oh, you were all of it. Yeah, I uh, created it. and uh, I'm completely, by the way, eating uh, my shoe right now. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, a, it's an idea I had, and I don't quite know where it came from, but I had an idea and wrote at the first hour, and then when I did a rewrite, I wrote the first two hours, because it just sort of kept going. And then we offered it around and um, Apple have taken it. And that's very exciting. So uh, we started shooting in, I think it was October, um, up in Vancouver. And it's going to be, I mean, I'm looking, funny enough, I'm looking at the cut of the first two episodes tomorrow morning. And uh, the rushes are amazing. Everybody's very, very excited. I uh, 
I'm very confident with Francis. He's uh, brilliant. He's, Francis he's is what fantastic. we call very talented. He's wonderful and, and calm and gets things done and actors love him and he's very, um, you know, inspired and creative. He's fantastic. The thing about television right now is that um, as someone who does this for a living, I cannot keep up with the no. abundance <coughs> of television Absolutely. and I can't keep up with great television. Mm. There's so many great shows. This is going to be Apple's big first push into the, the medium, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think it is about the show that can, you know, elevate it beyond, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. like where people are talking yeah, about yeah. it? Well, I mean, the concept is quite um, far out, you know, and, and I think what I've tried to do is make it about more than the component parts. So it's sort of, I hope it's sort of, uh, it's mythological and also I hope it's about the way things are now and the way people are and bigger issues other than, you know, just the plot and the story and the thrill of the ride, but that there is something there that will be more enduring, I think. The, obviously, the, a lot of the networks are spending a lot of money, uh, and Netflix, whoever it is, on making television look amazing. Mm -hmm. How is Apple as a partner, as a the, as the producer, and are they sort of going big, if you will? Yeah, I, again, a lot of this is not announced, but um, it, there were good reasons why we wanted to do it with them, um, which are to do with what's on the screen and off it as well. Okay, I'm very, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, uh, I'm just trying to think if, uh, if there could be tie-ins with certain Apple products or, you know. Oh, it's not so much, I mean, I, I just, I just like, I liked the, uh, the ethos that, was presented. I mean, I don't know about the, the rest of Apple as a, as a, as a, a corporation, but the, tele, the people who are making the television, I've sensed some genuine desire to do really good stuff. Yeah, I, as I said, the, the other thing, though, is it's going to be their first show. So, you know, if not the first, then the second, but it's... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that that decision hasn't been made, but yeah, we, we hope we'll be there. Um, you, uh, I looked at, uh, are you doing Rio? What, or am I yeah. wrong about this? No, no, I wrote, um, I wrote that script quite a while ago as well. Um, and yeah, we are close to going into production, I think. So basically this year is another record year for you. Yeah. I mean, it's strange how all these things come together, but it, it there are a few things coming together all at the same time, which is great because they're written, so I can sort of sit back and let the other people do the work. And then there will be a few rewrites, I suppose. But yeah, you know, it's, it's shaping up to be quite busy. Uh, when you're writing a script, for example, with Serenity uh, or Rio or anything else, how long does it typically take you? And are you showing early drafts to people or do you like do eight drafts and then start showing it? No, I don't um, show anybody anything until it's, till it's ready. Um, unless there's a really good reason, uh, and I can't think of one. Um, so what I tend to do is, rather than write the whole thing and then go back to the beginning and do a whole draft, I tend to keep, I always start, whenever I sit down to write, I start at the beginning. So I go through everything that's already written and change it and change it and change it as I'm going along. Um, and then I don't tend to have a plan when I start, sometimes not even what it's about. Uh, I, I tend to sort of sit there and, and start and then almost see what I've written, you know what I mean? It, and, and go through and then look at it and think, well, what's that about? You know, how did that change? And sometimes things happen on the page that completely contradict stuff you've done before. And you have to sort of I give authority to what came last. So you have to reverse engineer the whole thing. So it's a very odd process, I think. Um, and I try not to make it too logical and conscious if possible. It's so interesting because so many writers I speak to have a very detailed treatment. I or couldn't do that. I couldn't. I, I don't I, I think I'll, it's not as if I'm saying this is the best way of doing it because it's not because it's, it's quite inefficient. But for me, um, I try to, it, 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 I've sort of thought about it and, and for me, it's more like, you know, everybody dreams. You, you fall asleep and you have a dream. And in that dream, it's very weird and bonkers and all sorts of strange things happen, but the characters are true and the dialogue is really good and everybody does it. You know what I mean? If you think about your dream, it's sometimes a character based on someone you know steps into the dream and you have a conversation. There must be a part of everybody's mind that is capable of creating fiction from what is known, you know, the facts around them. So I try, if I can, to get when I'm writing to sort of allow myself 
into that situation where it's almost as if it's a dream that you're writing. So with Serenity, how long did the project actually take to write? Probably six weeks. Oh, that's not that. I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite, I, I think if it's good, it's quick. If it's slow, there's a reason. And it's probably not so good. So if, if something's really stuttering and taking ages, it's probably not. It's probably not right. What is the fastest script that you've written, and which is the one that took you the longest? Oh, boy. Um, if you remember. I can't remember. I mean, the, the problem with that is that sometimes you start, and then you're on something else, and then you're back on something. But I would say um, quickest would be Locke, I think, because that just came almost as a, a single event sort of thing. Um, and some of the others have taken a long time. Uh one of my last things for you. Uh, the Right now, the theatrical business has kind of shifted a little bit mm -hmm. where it's more like event pictures. Yes. And the superhero genre yes. has turned into the, the thing that's the normal thing. Yeah. It's just massively yeah. popular. Yeah. Uh, does the superhero genre at all interest you? And have you had people asking you to work on it? Because it seems like that's the thing that is really... Yeah, I mean, I've I've been asked to to do stuff, and I'm not against it. I don't think it, it you know it's it. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's a problem if it if that's all that's all that's on offer. Uh, and I think the, you know the structure of the of the business being what it is, where you have to fill so many big theatres that you know you tend to. Um, get restricted in, in what you can do. I mean, it's not something that I would sit down and choose to do. And, you know, but obviously World War Z 2 and all of that. I've, d I've worked on, and um, in a sense, uh, Girl in the Spider's Web as well. You know, they are genre films, and I'm more than happy to, to do them because it's right and, it's, you know, and the money's good and, and it's good fun to do. But I just hope that... I, I think the thing that needs to be reformed is theatres is the way that people meet a film you know that they have to go to a theater in the way in a very conventional way and sit down with loads of other people and watch it there's got to be another way of getting smaller budget perhaps more um relevant films about real reality not that my films about reality but you know the smaller films getting them out there um and getting them to people because i think the job of a, of a writer and a director is really simple. You've got to get people in a room, turn off the lights, and get them to look at a screen for 90 minutes or two hours, however you can do that. Just do it any way you want. And I, I worry that the more there are rules and regulations that are imposed on uh, filmmakers because of you know, the financial constraints, the less creativity there'll be. I, I, well, I've said repeatedly that I think the biggest issue is that theaters are so structured with their um with the rule for example i firmly believe that a movie that cost 10 million dollars mm -hmm. and a movie that cost 200 million dollars should not be the same ticket price mm -hmm. I, I just think there needs to be different pricing and yeah. i also think that where you sit in the theater if you're in the first few rows should be cheaper than mm -hmm. if you're in the prime middle yeah. of the theater yeah. there are things that can be done to yeah. entice people um to yeah. come in and see smaller movies yeah but they don't want to do it. I know. It, 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 it is, um, and I think that's why television has sort of prospered so much, is that a lot of people, including myself, see uh, creative freedom much more in television. Sure. Uh, I've taken so much of your time, no and I haven't even talked about uh, uh, Peaky Blinders and a whole bunch of other things, but I'm going to leave that for next time. Um, I will just say thank you so much for coming in. It's a pleasure. Congrats on this. Thank you. And I'm very curious if other people, uh, what they're going to think, because it is not everything, it is not exactly what you see. No, exactly. You know? Exactly. Um, on that note, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we're out.